Okay, <clears throat> well, the title of my talk, Building on Expert Advice to Create an Informed Model, was actually given to me by Isa. So I try to, I try to say something about this in probably five minutes, based on the experiences that I and my two colleagues in the back, Jamie Joyce and Mark Nunhuizen, uh, have experienced while trying to, yeah, to do simulation modeling in our project that is basically dealing with uh, the occupation of the Dutch river area in Roman times. And <coughs> as you can see at, from the project setup, there's quite a bit of stuff that we wanted to cover there. Uh, so on the one hand, <coughs> Uh, you can see that we are talking about conceptual models that have been sort of buzzing around in our college in the Netherlands about how things work in the Roman time in the Dutch area. Questions to do with subsistence, with demography, and with economic uh, questions. Then, on top, we have, of course, all this data that is supposed to tell us something about this, uh, in particular archaeological data, but also coming from archaeobotany, archaeology, paleogeography, and at the bottom, we have what I at the time thought would be a great idea to try to use spatial dynamic modeling, and I specifically didn't focus on agent data at that time because I wasn't sure if that was going to be the real answer to things. So, yeah, in a sense, it was quite ambitious, I think. <coughs> so, what did we want to know? What did we need to know? For example, what is the reproduction rate of a herd of sheep? What is the effect of manure on crop production? What is the surplus required to feed the Roman troops? And what is the effect of recruiting unavailable labor force, which is a specific question for this area because it is known from historical sources that the local population was recruited to fight in the Roman army. So these are not necessarily questions I think that you need to answer with agent-based modeling, but simulation, we thought, since archeology span is not much help for these questions, <laughs> might be the way out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, what I'm going to show you uh, very shortly is an example on a small model that I built myself and that was uh, completely devastated by Tom Bruckman's when I put it into review. <coughs> uh, <laughs> it's about estimates of population size in the area with people, which people have been talking about for quite some time. So they have been trying to estimate on the basis of, say, archaeological data, how many sites have we, how many people would have lived in those sites, how many of these sites do we actually have in the area? Estimates based on yeah, sort of historical data. The recruitment is actually described in Roman sources, not in great detail, but at least we know sort of the size of the legions that they needed and the kind of uh, people that they wanted for that. So on the basis of quite crude demographical models, people have suggested this, that this would meet, mean something like a 1.2, 1.5 male surplus per household per 20 year. And there's also been attempts to estimate the carrying capacity of the area to sort of figure out how many people might have lived there. And as you see, these estimates are yeah, not really compatible, really. <coughs> so I thought, okay, let's try to put this into a simulation model that is, on the one hand, trying to model reproduction of, of humans, so a demographic model. And unlike what Isa just said, it's not that simple, actually. We don't understand everything about it. Uh, <laughs> and on the, other hand, the on the other hand, the recruitment. So on the one hand, we have say, sort of an ecological model, uh, to trying to get to grips with things like birth rates, uh, what are actual mortality figures in the Roman period, uh, rules for marriage, uh, when did people actually have children, at what age, uh, because this has an effect on the amount of children that they might produce in the course of the years. And one big assumption that is mentioned in the Roman sources, uh, that soldiers were not allowed to get married. I mean, there's. Uh, issues with that, but I don't go into that. <coughs> For the recruitment itself, yeah, to just to judge the effect of what it means if you actually take out a portion of the male population, I uh, just uh, put up a, a recruitment rate into the model that would just take out a specific portion of the male population aged between 80 and 25 to fight in the Roman army with a 25 year service term. Now. The output actually is probably a bit difficult to interpret directly, but you can see here uh, in the yellow and green, slightly green lines, uh, the, the output after 30 years of recruitment. So you can see with the increasing recruitment rates in that direction, that the actual number of soldiers, the light green line, goes up. And the population sort of stays quite stable. <coughs> However, if you continue this for 100 years, then you see big differences in 
what you actually achieve when you apply a certain recruitment rate. So there is kind of a stabilization point around here where a, yeah, a Roman administrator could say, okay, if I take that many persons out of the male population, then the population will sort of stay stable. So that's what we got out of that, which offers, of course, some, uh, yeah, some results and some questions. <coughs> So, on the one hand, uh, the low recruitment rate needs a larger population. With a high recruitment rate, you actually see a population decline. All in all, this would mean that, say, a stable recruitment of the kind that we are talking about would need about 80,000 people, which is higher than people thought before, and is also higher than we can derive from settlement densities. So, there may be something else going on, which is actually what we set out to achieve, to figure out if this was the kind of thing that could work or not. Now. <coughs> What I said, archaeology is probably not very informative for defining all kinds of modeling parameters, but it might give you some idea of what you want to play around with. Archaeological data will tell you something about what people might have, might have eaten, uh, yeah, what kind of things they have been doing, but it's not going to be very specific about the figures. So we can and have to be creative and draw from other surface sources. In our case, we're thinking about ethnography, historical sources, experimental archaeology, even biology. And the main question is really, how do we know whether these are hitting the nail on the head? Well, I would like to open up discussion, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I came across this criticism very often when you say, oh, I'm using parameter values derived from a large sample of hunter-gatherer groups collected by a person, and the first thing that would happen, people stand up and say, you cannot use hunter-gatherer data for non-homo sapiens, for hominins two million years ago. To which you say, well, I'm sorry, but they didn't do the census. I have no idea what their population growth rate is. They didn't take notes, sadly. And, you know, at the end of the day, humans in the present are the best proxy for humans in the past. Because the alternative would be to use elephants. Yeah. So, yeah. It's not ideal, but that's what we have. It's sort of interesting to, to read up on uh, demographic uh, literature in historical uh, sources as well, but also how people think, think about it in archaeology. There's hardly any attempt at modeling at all that is based on yeah, data, I would say, which is quite surprising. So it's all based on kind of uh, yeah, idealized assumptions, ecological assumptions about how humans reproduce. Uh, it was quite hard actually to, to, to get to grips with this and uh, even when presenting the model right now there's yeah, lots of issues that you could attack and say okay well this probably is not correct, that's not correct. So yeah you can then start playing around with the parameters, look at the sensitivity and stuff like that uh, to get you a little bit further. But, uh, yeah, we're not there yet at this moment. I think that was something that I meant when I said that you know this is an evolutionary process with why our models are so have so many parameters and are so complicated now because we know so little. But the more models you have, I mean, if I was to run a model of you know the Roman recruitment, I would just bang your figure in, mm -hmm. yeah. no discussion. Well, yeah, <laughs> I would say, but that, would, that would be a real risk, obviously. Uh, it would be a people real would buy this and then sure. start using it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you already <laughs> showed it. Would be good no career, but, yeah, yeah, there's something something more there to, mm -hmm. uh, to take. But yeah, if you have several models and they all kind of focus on yeah. the same number, then at some point you just say, well, okay, that looks pretty plausible. Let's just use that number. Let's not, let's not go, you know, crazy with trying to test different stuff. Are there any questions? Are there any experts that would like to say, you with your models, you know, you simplify it. It actually, it was completely different. Yes. Not an expert, but a question. Yeah. Um, what's the epigraphic data like? for, say, children or burials or some kind of soldier uh, evidence well, around forts on the limits? Yeah, well, there is, there is uh, some epigraphic evidence for soldiers actually getting married and taking their families uh, into the, uh, the military camps. So I'm quite sure that what I presented right now is not fully realistic. Uh, okay. So that, that, that's for sure. In terms of uh, yeah, how many children they had and when they married, uh, it's all very much circumstantial, and uh, what there is is usually based on Rome and the big Roman cities of the countryside. You're sort of uh, yeah, hoping that people in the countryside did sort of the same thing as they did in the cities, which is, I'm not sure at all. So, 
you started out by saying that you didn't do agent-based modeling back then because you felt like it was too much of a black box. You didn't really know. What do well, you? I, 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 when I wrote the proposal, I didn't. I, I did put it in, but not as say the tool to be used. Do you think it. that it is a more appropriate and helpful tool? How has your how has your thinking evolved regarding uh, these? Well, actually, what I present here now, there is very little uh, agent interaction model at all. Actually, some of the things that Jamie has been doing there is agent interaction as well. So it really depends on, I guess, what kind of thing you want to you want, you want to do. Uh, yeah, obviously, the net logo program is a neat piece of software that allows you to do different things. You should also put in the models that Elizabeth. Uh, Showed earlier, like the cellular automata, the, uh, the 3D CAD models, uh, probably even systems, uh, system dynamics could be done in that way. So, in that sense, it, I think it opens up a lot of possibilities that otherwise yeah, you would have to use very different tools for uh, before you actually can figure out if it does something for you. And maybe at some point you can say, okay, well, that load is really too limited. Now I'm going to do the real stuff somewhere else. That's fine. But uh, yeah, as an experimental tool, I really like it. So starting this project, you had this workshop yeah. where you draw all the experts, probably yeah. trying to like pick their knowledge about this. Yeah. So I would not like to ask you, I would like to ask Mark and Jamie, yeah. was that useful? Was it actually useful getting the archaeologists and kind of trying to get the numbers and the stuff out of them? Um, well, for me, um, yes, very much so, but there's still gaps. Um, and I wanted to ask, actually, from, say, a junior researcher perspective, when you have, when I'm using parameters, for example, in fieldwood collection of one of um, ethnographic research from Equatorial Guinea, um, and as a junior researcher, it's perhaps more difficult for me to um, stand up to a lot of criticism about why I've used those parameters, is there isn't anything else a good enough defense um, when someone, yeah, is really picking apart what you've been doing. Um, because, yeah, as Philip said, I'm using, I've got to find something from somewhere. Um, otherwise, it's pure guesswork. And in your PhD defense, if you say, oh, I guess, it's not going to stand up very well. Yeah. But it kind of makes you realize how how did people do it before? You know? I mean, they, 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 they just went for the guesswork. They just said, well, well let's say, I was about this. You know, yeah. by logic. So I feel like the, I think we're all coming back to over and over to the same topic of like formalizing of the of the stuff we want to do, the questions and the systems that we imagined were in place. That is so immensely useful, even if the model in itself doesn't actually show you anything new. At least you know what information you are looking for and what information we need. So I, that's, I think going back to that workshop also it was very useful to have. People say, don't worry about that. That in, if you're simulating over 100 years, I, I remember you saying something about eggs. Did it really matter if they were eating eggs or not? Because over 100 years, the calorific content is so <laughs> tiny compared to tons of grain. Um, so that was very useful to know, OK, maybe you don't need to include that. Yeah, I know. But I remember the day before, somebody pointed out, oh, yeah, but you don't take into account the calories coming from wine. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sweet baby Jesus, I mean, how, how much stuff? Like, oh yeah, you have to make very simple models, you know, simple and elegant, because otherwise we don't understand. But what about the wine? I mean, what about the wine? <laughs> you have to say, show me the wine is important. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, there's always this thing. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, now I need somebody.